The day my life changed forever wasn't marked by an earth-shattering event. No warning signs, no discussions, just a single sentence from my husband, Mark, as he walked through the door. Mom's moving in with us. I stood in our living room, frozen, unsure if I had misheard him. But the look on his face was serious, almost impatient. I should have seen it coming. But that wasn't the most shocking part. Without even waiting for me to respond, he added, You'll need to give up your room for her. I already moved your things into the hallway. My heart sank. My room? The one space in the house that still felt like mine? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. Where am I supposed to sleep? I asked, my voice barely above a whisper, though I already knew the answer. He looked at me with a dismissive smirk. The hallway should be fine for you, he said, as if it was the most reasonable thing in the world. And just like that, the room I had called my own for the past three years was now my mother-in-law's. My belongings were thrown into the hallway like they were clutter, in the way of something more important. I should probably introduce myself. My name is Sarah, and I'm a 35-year-old housewife. Not too long ago, my life was entirely different. Five years ago, I lost both of my parents in a tragic car accident. They were my only family. No siblings, no extended relatives. Suddenly, I was alone in the world, and the weight of that loneliness pressed down on me like a crushing boulder. In my grief, I became desperate to build a family of my own. That's when I met Mark. He was charming, confident, and attentive. He made me feel safe, like maybe I wasn't alone anymore. Within a few months, we were married. He seemed like everything I had been searching for, someone who could fill the void left by my parents. At first, life was good. We were happy. I was working as a nurse. And though the job was demanding, I found purpose in helping others. But over time, the stress of long shifts and the emotional toll of the work began to wear me down. Eventually, I hit my breaking point. I was diagnosed with burnout and had to take a leave of absence from the hospital. That was when Mark suggested I quit. Sarah, you need to take care of yourself, he had said, his voice full of concern. Quit your job and stay home. I'll take care of everything. At the time, his offer seemed like a blessing. I was exhausted, and the thought of stepping away from the stress of nursing was tempting. So I did it. I quit my job and became a full-time housewife. Little did I know, that decision would mark the beginning of a much darker chapter in my life. At first, everything seemed fine. Mark was supportive, always checking in on me and making sure I was comfortable at home. But slowly, things started to shift. He began to control small aspects of my life, how I spent my time, what I wore, who I could talk to. I'm only doing this because I care about you, he would say, and I believed him. I convinced myself that he was just looking out for me, but soon those small restrictions became all-encompassing. I stopped seeing my friends. Mark would get annoyed whenever I made plans with them, so eventually I just stopped trying. My world shrank to the size of our house, and Mark became the center of it. I no longer had a job, I no longer had friends, and now, as I stood there in the hallway with my belongings, I realized I no longer had a room of my own. Judy, my mother-in-law, arrived the next day. She walked into the house as if she owned it, her sharp eyes scanning everything with a judgmental air. I tried to be polite, offering to help her settle in, but she brushed me off. It was clear that she didn't see me as an equal in this household. To her, I was nothing more than the maid. From now on, make sure to cook for three people, Mark had said that morning. And don't bother Mom with any of the chores. You're here to take care of her, after all. I couldn't argue. I didn't have a voice in these decisions anymore. I had given up that right the day I quit my job and became dependent on him. The days that followed were a blur of criticism and verbal attacks. Nothing I did was good enough for Judy or Mark. You can't even wash dishes properly, Judy would sneer, inspecting each plate as if she expected to find something wrong. Are you trying to kill us with this food? It's too salty. Mark, too, had become colder, more demanding. 
Every day was filled with orders, complaints, and insults. I felt like a prisoner in my own home, but somehow I convinced myself that this was my fault. Maybe if I just worked harder, tried harder, I could make them happy. Then came the night that broke me. Judy had invited a guest over for dinner, and she demanded that I prepare a meal worthy of a luxury hotel. I spent the entire day cleaning every inch of the house and cooking an elaborate dinner, hoping that this would finally earn their approval. B. But when the guest arrived, Judy ordered me to stay in the hallway. You don't need to be seen, she said. Just stay out of the way. I obeyed without question, retreating to my makeshift bed in the hallway. From there, I could hear the muffled sounds of laughter coming from the dining room. I felt like an outsider, unwanted in my own home. The guest stayed the night, and before I could go to sleep, Judy approached me. Sleep in the kitchen tonight, she said, as if it was a normal request. It's not a good look for our guest to see you sleeping in the hallway. I had grown so used to obeying their absurd demands that I didn't even question it, but something felt different this time. There was a knot of unease in my stomach that wouldn't go away. The next morning, as I lay on the cold kitchen floor, I heard a voice, a man's voice, unfamiliar and filled with surprise. What are you doing here? He asked. Do you actually sleep here? I sat up, startled. It was Judy's guest from the night before. His eyes were wide with disbelief, as if he couldn't comprehend what he was seeing. I am Mark's wife, I said, my voice flat. I sleep in the hallway. Or sometimes here, I guess. His face hardened with concern. This isn't right, he muttered. You shouldn't be treated like this. I didn't know what to say. No one had ever questioned how I lived before. I had convinced myself that this was normal, that this was just how things were. The man, whose name I later learned was Jack, handed me a small piece of paper. Meet me at the cafe down the street later today, he whispered. Don't tell Mark or Judy. I stared at the paper, unsure of what to do, but there was something in Jack's voice, a seriousness that made me think he might actually care. For the first time in a long while, someone was reaching out to me. That afternoon, while Judy and Mark were out, I made an excuse to go grocery shopping and slipped out of the house. My heart was pounding as I walked to the cafe. I had never done anything like this before. The fear of what might happen if Mark found out was overwhelming, but the thought of talking to someone, anyone, was stronger. When I arrived at the cafe, Jack was already waiting. He wasn't alone. Sitting across from him was a woman I didn't recognize. Sarah, this is Emma, Jack said. She's a friend of mine. Emma smiled warmly, and I felt an odd sense of comfort in her presence. We ordered coffee, and for the next hour we talked. Well, I talked. I poured out everything I had been holding inside for so long. The isolation, the insults the way Mark and Judy controlled every aspect of my life. Emma listened without interrupting, her eyes full of understanding. As the conversation went on, I realized how much I had been keeping inside. I had almost forgotten what it was like to talk to someone who actually listened, who didn't judge or criticize me at every turn. Over the next few days, I met with Emma and Jack several more times. Each time, I felt myself growing stronger, more aware of how trapped I had been. Emma was patient, never pushing me too hard, but gently helping me see that what I had been living through wasn't normal. It wasn't love. It was control. It was during one of those meetings that Emma revealed she was a therapist. Jack had asked her to meet with me because he could see that something was very wrong in my life, but he knew I wouldn't open up right away. Emma had been helping me without me even realizing it. One night, after yet another round of complaints from Mark about my cooking, something inside me snapped. If it's not good enough for you, then cook it yourself, I said, my voice louder than I intended. The room fell silent. Mark's face twisted with rage, and for a moment I thought he was going to hit me, but instead he just glared at me, seething. You ungrateful woman, he spat. I want a divorce. 
Judy, who had been listening from the kitchen, chimed in. Good riddance. Get out of this house. Their words should have hurt, but all I felt was relief. A strange calmness settled over me. This was my chance. My escape. I packed my bags that night, moving quickly and quietly, afraid that Mark might change his mind and try to stop me. As I gathered my things, Judy watched me with a smug expression. If you're really sorry, we might forgive you, she said, as if she was offering me a lifeline. But I didn't want their forgiveness anymore. I wanted my freedom. Without another word, I walked out of the house and into the waiting taxi. As we drove away, I felt a weight lift from my shoulders, and for the first time in years, I allowed myself to imagine a future where I wasn't controlled by someone else. The days that followed were a whirlwind of legal proceedings. Mark tried to fight the divorce, claiming I had no right to leave, but with Emma's guidance I had already gathered the evidence I needed to prove the abuse. The recordings of Mark's insults, Akhtar Bacha says the photos of the bruises he had left on me, the medical reports, it was all there, in black and white. In the end, the court ruled in my favor. Mark was ordered to grant the divorce and pay compensation. The weight of the past few years began to melt away as I realized I was finally free. Since then, my life has changed in ways I never thought possible. I reconnected with old friends, found a job as a nurse again, and even started taking up hobbies I had long abandoned, like running and swimming. Emma and I remained close, and we would meet for coffee regularly, just to talk about life, or sometimes nothing at all. Looking back, I can't believe how long I allowed myself to be trapped in that toxic environment. But now, I've learned what true strength looks like. It doesn't come from enduring pain. It comes from standing up and walking away when you realize you deserve better. In the end, I didn't lose a family. I gained something far more valuable, myself. <laughs>